Today is Saturday, February the 22nd, 2020. The location is Story Point Senior Residence in Saline, Michigan. The time is 1.30 p.m. The person being interviewed is Richard Smith. Richard served in the United States Army Air Force as a pilot during World War II. The interview will be conducted by Dan Mehal. Also present at this interview will be the videographer Gary Delisle. This interview is being conducted on behalf of the Oral History Project at the Yankee Air Museum in Belleville, Michigan. How are you today, Richard? I'm doing great. That's good it's to hear. Okay. Can I call you Dick? Uh, what? Can I call you Dick? You may. Okay, great. That's better than some people call me. <laughs> <laughs> well, to start with, can you tell me when you were born, Dick? I was born on November 26, in 1922. And where were you born? I was born in Partyville, Wisconsin. My parents were brave enough to have eight kids during the Depression years. Holy smoke. And uh, my dad was an implement dealer, sold John Deere and International Harvester equipment. But along came the war, and of course he could get nothing to sell. Yeah. So he became a plumber. Interesting. Uh, the, the town was fortunate to have him as a mayor because with WPA and PWA workers, he was able to put in a sewage system for the community as well as a water system for the community. Wow. So he became a very popular man. <laughs> Where is Partyville? Partyville is 30 miles north of Madison. Okay. It's sort of in the center of the state? Uh, not quite. You okay. have to go north another 50 miles to find the center of the state. Okay. Were your parents born in this country? Uh, no. My parents, uh, dad was born in England and my mother was born in, in uh, Germany. Okay. So, but they, uh, they met then, uh, gee, I forget the year, uh, just before I was born, and at the end of World War II, and uh, they were married, and they set up business then in Partyville. Okay. And uh, what were their names? Uh, Charles and Lucille. Okay. Now, you said they had eight children. What what had were eight children, five girls and three boys. What were their names? Oh golly, Harry was the oldest. Harry became a Marine the day after the, you know, Pearl Harbor. So many of, actually, seventy percent of the male population at the college signed up for one of the uh, services, and. Uh, I would say that of the other 30%, uh, 20% 20 of them were farm kids who signed up, but they wouldn't take them off the Ford uh, farm because they were in need of the farmers to grow the food yeah. for the the armies. What do they call those necessary workers or some term? Yeah. Okay. And the other. We had a seminary connected with the school. 10% of the guys were going into the ministry services. Okay. So Harry served in the Marine Corps, you said? Yes. And, and did you, you were your other? He was commander of a 105 millimeter cannon group. And he lost about half of his men on the invasion of uh, Japan. Or Sir Bocce. Okay, I Iwo were, Jima? Yeah, the Japanese were just firing down on his group and they couldn't dig the foxholes deep enough. So he lost a lot of his personnel right there. Now, did your other brother serve as well? Uh, no, Jim was too young Okay. to serve. In fact, he was next to uh, Linda. Linda, who was was the youngest, and 
She was the first to die. She had a brain tumor. Couldn't get it all. Went in twice. But uh, she died of that, and Jim then was born just before she was. Okay. So you said your father was an implement dealer for John Deere? Is that for, for John Deere and International Harvester. Okay. So he and his brother established the, the business uh, in Partyville. And then, of course, the war comes along. They could get nothing to sell because everything was going into tanks and what have you. But, uh, so he became a plumber. Okay. And did your mother work outside the home? Uh, she did after the kids had grown. Okay. What did she do? She would work for, uh, she was an ice cream dipper in the local <laughs> ice cream shop. Okay. And she dipped ice cream for I don't know how many years. But uh, she was, was a super gal, and she had eight kids, and none of them were born in the hospital. They were all home births. Wow. We had one doctor in the town, and naturally he delivered them all. Okay. <laughs> okay, so you, you grew up in Partyville then? I grew up in Partyville. Okay. Went to high school there. Oh, you went to high school there. Okay. Yeah, and I graduated in 1940 from the high school. But we, uh, the high school only had five teachers, and uh, the we only had one sport that was offered to, because we didn't have enough of football. Or, Baseball. Okay. Right. In fact, we were lucky to have 12, 10 guys for basketball. But uh, luckily, we had a great coach, Mel Barkley, and he won the state Class C championship in 1936. And my brother was on the team in 1938 when they got beaten in the semifinals. Wow. When I graduated in 1940, they had lumped all three divisions together. They just had one division. They had eight regionals in the state, and we were fortunate enough to win one of the eight positions in the state tournament, even though we only had 10 guys that could play basketball. And... Uh, we were fortunate enough to get to, through the bigger teams in the regional up at Wapan. And then uh, we beat Ripon. We beat, uh, Wap no, Port Washington. And then we beat uh, Brandon, which is a school just outside Milwaukee. So we were down in the field house when they held the state tournament. And we there was one of the Class C team that made it. And we, naturally, we ran into a buzzsaw. We had never shot basketball unless we had a wall right behind the basket right. or bleachers right behind the basket. In fact, we played in gyms you wouldn't believe. Uh, over Ryle had it, the uh, right corner, they had their furnace, and it was an old uh, theater that they turned into a basketball floor. <laughs> we played in Randolph, where you could reach, they had one row of chairs around the outside, and you could stand on the out-of-bounds line and reach up and touch the ceiling. Holy so the ceiling just went up and right at the top of the backboard. So the only place you could shoot was lay-ins, practically. You couldn't take a long shot because, bingo, they'd be hitting the, <laughs> the, the ceiling right away. But uh, you know, we played on Fox Lake, which was a dance floor. And talk about slipping and sliding. <laughs> You'd try to set up a pivot, and bingo, you'd go on your duff almost. 
but uh, it was quite an experience. So, how many? Do you remember how many kids were in the school in the high school? Uh, yeah, approximately there were twenty-five in each class, so it was just one hundred and twenty-five, I think. Okay. Okay. So you said you graduated in 1940 from high school? I graduated in 1940 from the high school. So what did you do after you graduated? I went down to college and I finished my education. I got in two years before the war in 41 and 42. And then uh, I served my time in, in uh, during World War II, and I served active from 42 until 46, and then I joined the reserve, and I was in the reserve until 59. Okay. Um, now, do you remember where you were when you heard about Pearl Harbor? Yes, I was sitting in the Lovell Theater in Partyville, Wisconsin. And all of a sudden, the guy stopped the, the film, and he says, the Japanese have just attacked Pearl Harbor. And of course, Roosevelt declared war the next day. And as I said, 70% of our male population signed up for one of the services. And the PWA and the other guys uh, were working for the public works or the civilian projects in the communities. So uh, we were fortunate to, to have what we had. We had a big cistern underneath the garage and we'd pump water in there. And Mob, in order to use that water, she put a big on the stove, get it boiling, and then put it in a cooler to get it cold enough to use. So she had to boil it before you could use it? Yeah. Okay. It wasn't completely warm. Uh -huh. So did you enlist soon after Pearl Harbor then? Uh, I, I enlisted, uh, yeah. In fact, I enlisted in, I'm trying to remember the exact date. I enlisted, I graduated from high school and started. And so the Pearl Harbor was my first year at college and I ran out and the guys, is, you know, I joined up with the Army Air Force right away. I wanted to fly P-38s, but, uh, you know, they had the bamboo bombers in the, in the Air Force for right. training purposes. But luckily, I didn't get an Air Force bomber. I got an AT-9, which was a little uh, all-metal plane. And boy, that was probably the best airplane I flew. But then I went on to Corsicana with PT-19s. Okay. Went up to Enid, Oklahoma for BT-13s. And then to Altus, Oklahoma for AT-9s. Yeah. My instructor at Altus was a guy by the name of George Goebel, the comedian. Yes, I remember George Goebel. And he was sitting on, Johnny Carson was interviewing he and Bob Hope and Jerry Lewis. And while he was talking with George, George had his cup of coffee over here. Jerry Lewis was sitting right there. He'd reach up, put his ashes <laughs> in George's uh, coffee cup. But uh, he was just all business in the air. But once he got on the air, on the ground, the guys would just come over to our airplane and shoot the breeze with George for a while. So the, the BT-13, that was the, the vaulty vibrator, right? Yeah. That's what mm -hmm. they called it? Yeah. And the AT-9 was for multi-engine training? 
Well, they, it was. I was hoping to get into uh, the book, the, the the twin engine. That I guess you call it right. The bamboo bomber, but I uh, got into 89s. But I also wanted to be a P-38 pilot. And the PT-9s, we had guys who were flying the PT-9s and going in uh, to fighter pilots. Okay. So, so um, after you um, flew AT-9s, where did you go from there? After I flew AT-9s, I joined up. Pearl Harbor occurred. Okay. And I signed up, and I was active then in 42. 42 to 45, I was active in serving in the South Pacific, Japan, and all the islands leading down from Japan to uh, until I got assigned uh, to Okinawa. Okay. We got a base there. Okay, so did you... What did you fly after you flew AT-9s? I flew, I originally was assigned to go to Shreveport, Louisiana to fly B-26s. But they had so many of us there that they sent some of us over to Bergstrom Field in Austin, Texas to fly the 47s. Okay, And so C-47s? Uh, yeah, C-47s. So I flew 47s for oh, almost a year, I guess. And then we got the 46s. I joined the 375th Troop Carrier Group. And we got the C-46s then as, we, as soon as we'd taken care of things in okay. Japan. So when you were in Texas, do you remember what year that was about? What year I was in Texas? That would have been 1943, about. Okay. And did you get married around that time then? I got married as soon as I got my wings. Ah. And that was in April of 44. And uh, our first child was born exactly one year after our marriage uh, to Gladys. She was. My brother and I married twin, not twin sisters, but sisters. My father, my brother was a Marine and he was a commander of a 105 millimeter cannon group. And uh, he lost half of his guys on Sirabachi. And then I was assigned Initially, they're flying 36s, but they had so many of us, they sent many of us over to Bergstrom Field in Austin, Texas, to fly the 47s. So that's what I became. Okay. And a, a transport pilot. Did you uh, ever go to a, a Pathfinder school? Yes, we did. We went to Pathfinder School. It was a run out of, I think, Fort Wayne, Indiana. And, uh, of course, the guys who really used it were the guys that were going into Europe when the 47s were carrying paratroopers in for the war. But uh, we didn't have any use for it. Where we, <laughs> I was doing my flying, okay. even though it was in our schedule. <clears throat> so when you went overseas, where did, can you uh, tell me where, the different stops that you made on your way over? On my way overseas, we left Hamilton Field in San Francisco, and then we flew to Hawaii, and then to Johnson Island, and then into Nadzab, New Guinea. Were you flying C-47s to do that? 47s, yeah. Okay. Tell me a little bit about New Guinea. New Guinea, well, I guess we were pretty fortunate to live and have control over where we did. On the west side, you had a, a mountain range which ran right down through the middle of New Guinea. On the west side, the cannibal 
<laughs> and on the east side, you had Port Moresby and even and the uh, airfield and the replacement pool guys. But uh, we made sure we always had guards out every night in case those cannibals decided they were going to make the trip across the <laughs> mountains. But as it was, the Japanese decided they could go into that west side and clean up the mountain. And uh, they found out that they lost too many guys to the cannibals. So, so, uh, so when you Tojo, got to, I'll oh, go ahead. Tojo didn't uh, have much success there. So when you first got to New, Z New Guinea, then you were at Nadzap? Nadzap, New Guinea. Nadzap, okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, my first trips out of New Guinea was down to Australia. Okay. Down to Perth and Townsville, way up on the north east corner of Australia. Why were you going to Australia? We went down there to pick up fresh meat, vegetables, and other things, you know, edibles that our cooks wanted to use. And uh, what else was it? Oh, the, uh, the east side, I mean the west side, the cannibals had pretty well control of that. And Tojo sent the Japanese forces in there to try to gain control. And I think he lost more <laughs> Japanese than, than anything. <clears throat> so I, I'm reading a book about, I just finished a book about the uh, 345th bomb group that flew B-25s in New uh -huh. Guinea. And they would have been probably based right where you were. Yes, they were. And they, they were, were called the Air Apaches. Do you remember yeah, them? I remember those guys. Okay. They were based right out of where we had the replacement pool in Nedzab. And then I think they moved, uh, no, we moved up to Hollandia and they moved to another island yeah. close by. Okay. Now, so when did you get uh, start flying C-46s in New Guinea? I got to flying C-46s, and that was after uh, our, we had taken control of Japan. And then to make the trip from Japan up to Okinawa, they thought they needed a little bigger aircraft, a okay. little more power, a little more carrying possibilities and okay. weight. And so we got the 46s then when we were headed for Okinawa. Okay. So when you were flying in New Guinea, then you were flying 47s? Yes. Okay. In the, when I, we first flew the 47s into Manila, spent the first two days carrying tanks of DDT, and we went back and forth over uh, Manila because disease was terrible there. And so we dropped DDT on most of Manila because the Japanese had left it just in a horrible state. So there was a crewman hanging out the door of the back of the C-47? No. No? No. We had the C-47s when they dropped them, yes. But th th with this, they had some type of a, uh, a rigged uh, sprays on okay. the phone that they, I mean, on the wings that you were able to skate, f fly back and forth with. Okay. It's interesting that you flew C-46s because I thought that they were mostly used in China, Burma, India. Oh, they, they used it for China. And, uh, but they had, as they say, as soon as we started to make the trip from Manila up to Okinawa, we got the 46s too, even though most of them were going to, for the China, for the okay. route into China.
So did you participate in any paratroop drops then? One parachute drop, and that was on Corregidor. Okay. Mm -hmm. That was with the C-47? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you were, you were there when the Philippines were invaded then? Uh, no, the Philippines had been invaded. I mean, we were there when they put all those prisoners up on the Bataan Peninsula. And we were there just as we started to release those prisoners. And I can remember sitting up uh, in our airfield and watching ambulance after ambulance and then truck with, you know, the veterans who could walk uh, were in trucks. Okay. But they, these guys, they took them right then. They had a big hospital ship parked in the harbor. And those that needed hospitalization were put in the, that hospital ship. And the rest of them, they'd put on the, uh, what they could find, <laughs> what room they could find uh, to take them back to the state. They're putting them on Liberty ships or something? Uh, the, we came back on LSTs, landing okay. surface troops. Okay. And so were you in the Philippines when the Japanese uh, surrendered? Uh, yes. Okay. In fact, when they surrendered, we were sitting on uh, the port at Yokohama. Okay. So you weren't in the Philippines, you were in Japan when... Yeah, I was in Japan, yeah. Okay. Now when you were on Okinawa, there was a, there was a loss of a crew um, to a kamikaze? Yeah, I think so. Can you describe that? Yeah, uh, kamikaze came in right at, at practically sea level. Underwent, the radar didn't pick him up on the battleships or the destroyers out in harbor. And that guy came up and he just flew. Luckily, our crew, we didn't lose the crew, but the came up and fired the kamikaze, flew into the last 46 in the line. And luckily the guys were pulling, playing poker or card games down at the, <laughs> at the terminal, so we didn't lose the crew. Okay. But we lost the airplane and also the airplane next to it. Okay, were you, uh, were you actually sleeping in the planes at that time? Or did you? Uh, we would sleep underneath the wings. Okay. We had cots that we carried along with us. And if they didn't have billets, then we would put up our cats, c cots and go to sleep underneath the wing. <laughs> now you said you were in Japan for the actual surrender. You were, did you, yes. could you actually see the surrender? I, we saw it on the, we stood up on the remains of a five story Japanese hotel. We stood up on the second floor and the, the Missouri was only say 300 yards away out in the harbor. Wow. So we watched uh, MacArthur and Stillwell sign that surrender agreement with the Japanese. And so it was quite a sight to see those sailors lined up all the way around all levels of that uh, Missouri. Okay. And so that was. So, was there a lot of bomb damage around the hotel that you were staying in? Oh, yeah. Yeah, there was all kinds of bomb damage. Because they dropped those incendiary bombs on Japan in the last few raids. And even before the big bombs, you could see where Japan was. It destroyed, I think their will to fight, except for their leaders. Okay. Um, so when you were in Japan, what did you, what was your mission or what did you do Our there? Our mission, uh, the three months I was still in there and still active, 
we served mail courier. We'd get the mail from the states and they'd, we'd load it on our 47s, and, or four, yeah, 47s, and then we went up to Hokkaido, to the air bases there, and Marine bases, and Navy bases, and CB bases. Wherever they were in Japan, we delivered mail okay. to them. So, so the Japanese surrendered in August of 45. Uh -huh. how, how long were you in Japan? Uh, I would say three months. Okay, so almost to like November, December, mm -hmm. something like that. So what happened um, when you came back? What happened when? Uh, so that was at in the end of '45. How, and you said you came home on an LST. Is that? I came home after I'd been in Japan for three months. Okay. Then I I came back on an LST. How long did that take? Do you remember? That's not uh, a very fast ship. It took me about four poker games away <laughs> <laughs> to get back. You know, it, uh, I must have been, it seemed like a long time. It was probably three months at sea at least. Okay. When So when you landed in the States, where did you land? We landed in Seattle. Okay. Is where we and we got, I lost, let's see, Seattle, and then I went from Seattle down to Fort MacArthur in Texas. Yeah, that sounds right. Uh -huh. And it was there that I got out of the Air Force, I mean out of the active Air Force, okay. but I joined the Reserve, and of course it became in 1947, I think, the U.S. Air Force, they eliminated the Army, and I see we've got another branch now that he just put in uh, where they're going to put in the uh, Oh, were they? Space Force. Space Force, that's what it's called, yeah. So when you were in the reserves, where were you based? Based in Chicago. Okay. At O'Hare Field. Okay. So did you, did you get called up for Korea? Uh, one of our groups, one of our squads did. The 40, we had the 47th, 48th, and 49th. Uh, the 47th was called up for Korea, and they moved the 49th to Selfridge Field. Okay. And the 48th stayed at O'Hare. Okay. So I flew out of O'Hare then for okay. my reserve time. My dad was in the reserves at Selfridge. At Selfridge? Yeah. yeah. So he flew C 47s too. Uh huh. Um, so. What did you do? So you said you, when you came back, you um, became a school teacher. Yes, I became a school teacher and coach. I coached at. Uh, well, I went to college here, where I played all three sports, and then I signed up to be a school teacher at that little district, where I'd done my student teaching in Naperville. Okay, just outside so, of Chicago. Yeah, 30 miles west of Chicago. So, and I coached football for 34 years and I coached basketball for five years, but then I officiated basketball, high school and college for 30 years. And in baseball pro, I started the Little League and Pony League as well as the baseball program at the high school. And I coached that for 29 years. Wow, okay. So you, you married your wife in 1944 and you had a son in 45. I had a son in 45. And then what? And then, and then a daughter in 47. What was her name? 
uh, her daughter was Linda. Linda, okay. And then I had a son in 1953 named David. And then a son in 1940, our surprise package. <laughs> and, and we had him in 1940. 19, not 1940, 19, no. had to be after 53. 53 in 1960. Okay, okay. So where do your uh, sons and daughters live now? My son, oldest son, is in Houston. He's having some problems right now with his health. My daughter is in Virginia, Staunton, Virginia, and I have a son in Las Vegas. Okay. And also another son in Winchester, Virginia. Okay, so Staunton and Winchester are close together. Yeah, Staunton, yeah. Winchester's further north than Staunton. Staunton is just off of 81, I think, is the, the freeway that goes north-south. Yeah. And they're about, oh, I would say 40 miles south of Staunton. I mean, Staunton is 40 miles south of Winchester. Right, yeah. So you, 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 you lived in Illinois right. and raised your family in Illinois. How did you end up in Ann Arbor? Uh, it's my second marriage. Uh, so I, I was in Illinois from, oh golly, well if I was at football for 34 years and I retired finally in 85 from the reserve. So I mean, it was shortly after, uh, shortly after 30, let's see, 42. I was in Illinois then from 41 until 69 and so far as the reserve is concerned. Okay. Okay, so you, how did you end up in Ann Arbor then through, from your second marriage? Second marriage, I married a gal who was Basically, her husband had been, she met him. She was in Louisville, right across the river. Was uh, He was from the airfield just south of Louisville. And she was working. She lived just across the river in Indiana, but she was working in Louisville. And she met him and they were married, uh, I think, I'm trying to remember how many years, but a good number of years. So she had five children. So she had a girl who is now in, in Ypsilanti. Okay. And a girl who's in Ann Arbor and a son who's in Mount Pleasant. And she has a daughter who's out in San Francisco, Mountain View, California. And uh, let's see, that's four. I don't know. <laughs> that's that's that. okay. So, so basically she moved up here to be close to the three that are... Well, she, yeah, we, after her second marriage, she lived up in, up on a Saginaw, near Saginaw. Uh, I forget the name of the town now. But anyway, that's where her husband was employed by Gannett Publishing. So he took over newspapers and they put him in charge of the newspaper down in the Ipsy area. And when she was living there when her kids started high school and graduated from high school. So, oh, and then as I say, my first wife died, and I married Barbara, 
when she was living in Indiana. So okay. Okay. Well, I've just got one last question for you. Um, if you had to, if you had to, to say something to the young people growing up today, based on your experiences, what would you tell them? I would tell them steer clear of trouble in high school. Choose your friends carefully. Don't get involved in the bang bang group that. Uh, when it comes to sex or to drugs, just make sure that you don't get involved with those kind of people. And obey what your mom and dad say and stay, believe the teachers, they're trying to help you. They're not trying to hurt you. Even though this time we find that the schools are becoming so liberal in some of their teaching that it makes, makes an old timer like me cringe when I see what's going with so yeah. many young people today. But uh, stay clear of trouble and stay clear, may choose your friends wisely. And if they get involved in that sort of thing, they are no longer your friends. Well, I don't have anything else, Dick. Thank you for your time, and well, I enjoyed talking to you. Well, I enjoyed it so very much, too. Well, I'm glad. Okay. Have a good day. Okay, thank you.